Hello everyone, my name is Kai Werner from Confluent. Today we will talk about the Kappa architecture and the Lambda architecture. I will explore several real-world use cases and the trade-offs of deploying Kappa as a real-time infrastructure compared to batch processing with the Lambda architecture. At the end you will see a comparison of several different event streaming technologies and vendors so that you can choose the right one. Let's get started. First of all, in this case, I talk a lot about Kafka today because it's the de facto standard for event streaming and processing data in motion. Nevertheless, as I said at the end, you will also see a comparison of different vendors and also other technologies like Pulsar, for example. So there is other options on the market and you can choose the right one. So this discussion is really about the principles behind Kappa and Lambda here. So I will not give an intro to Kafka or event streaming here. The point really is that the heart of this infrastructure is built for processing data in motion in real time at scale. And this can be done for analytical workloads, big data, but also for transactional workloads, often smaller volumes, but much more critical where you don't accept data loss. And therefore you can really connect Kafka to anything if you have the right connectors, like to transactional systems like a mainframe or an ERP system, but also to all the big data workloads using any kind of data warehouse, data lake, or other cloud service. So that's in the end what I mean with event streaming here as the, the context for, for using it in this presentation today. And here's an example of that. So many people still think about event streaming with uh, technologies like Kafka or Confluent as a data ingestion layer into a data warehouse or data lake. And that's still very valid actually. Many of our Confluent customers, for example, ingest a lot of their data into a data lake or data warehouse, like Snowflake, for example, or a cloud native data warehouse from a vendor like Google BigQuery. But that's really just part of the platform, right? You have to think about. A lot of the value for many use cases comes when you also process the data in motion. That's where streaming analytics or stream processing comes into play. Because if you ingest the data into your data lake or data warehouse, well, then it's still a batch process. And that's totally fine for reporting, for batch analytics, for training analytic models. But it's not the right approach if you want to process data in real time. That's what stream processing technologies are built for. So that's Kafka native technologies like Kafka Streams or KSQL DB. That's other independent frameworks like Apache Flink or some kind of cloud service, which is a fully managed offering of that. So my point here is really that when you think about event streaming and then about the Kappa architecture, you should know that um, technologies like Kafka are much more than an ingestion layer. Event streaming really talks about the complete platform, including the end-to-end -end data integration, including the data processing, and including the true decoupling of all these applications so that you can build real-time and batch with one layer. In this example here, I use the Confluent Technologies, obviously the company I work for, but this just should show you the, the, the differences right here, that you can do much more with event streaming than just ingesting data into a batch tool like a data warehouse. And I really want to emphasize again that um, with event streaming, it's not just about sending the data from A to B in real time. Event streaming also has a storage layer. And with this, you truly decouple the different systems from each other. They can have different technologies, different communication paradigms, and different processing speeds. Not everything is real time. You still will have batch layers like a file connectivity to legacy, or maybe even in a cloud data warehouse where you ingest it in near real time. And this is the huge benefit of event streaming that you don't just provide the capability to process data at scale in real time, but also because you store it in an event-based manner, you also decouple the different systems so that also non-real-time systems can handle it. Yeah, and this is crucial to understand before now we finally come to the Lambda versus Kappa discussion. So Lambda architecture is a term which is known very well in the industry for many years now. There is actually two different kind of options if you take a look at the um, literature on the internet, on the books. So this is the example one, where you have a unified serving layer. This means you have a lot of data sources on the left side. And then you either decide to build a real-time layer for process data in motion, for example, with Kafka, 
And then you also have a batch layer where you process data at rest, for example, with Hadoop. And then you build a joint unified serving layer so that your applications on the right side can either be real-time or batch applications. So this is in the end one kind of the Lambda architecture where you separate the real-time from the batch layer. Another option is actually where you also separate the serving layers. So you really build one speed view for real-time and you build a batch view for well, you could say too late architecture or reporting architecture. Anyway, the data is at rest and you don't process it in real time. It's more about minutes or hours or days. Then, however, if you have these two separate serving layers, then you need to correlate and connect it together again on the right side in the application. Where on the one side you could have a real time or batch query that only connects to one layer. But then you also need a lot of mixed queries because very often you need to combine the historical and the real time data. So no matter if you think about the separate serving layers or unified serving layer in the Lambda architecture. It's two separate architectures and infrastructures for real time and for batch. Well, and that's a key part of the concern with the Lambda architecture. And here you see um, why you shouldn't use the Lambda architecture. And I'm directly referring to Disney. They have given a, a great talk about that at a Kafka summit. So one of the biggest problems I see from our customers is that you need to have duplicate code. You have two infrastructures to operate completely separate from each other, often two different teams, two different vendors behind it for support. And you have to write code duplicated very often because sometimes you need to process data in real time for some use cases. And then you need to process it again in batch for some reporting use cases. So this is really two different complex systems and and this is expensive and this is risky for your mission critical workloads and um, therefore there's a lot of reasons why lambda shouldn't be the way to go in 2020 and then years after that because there's a better option for many use cases there is the kappa architecture it's not that well known in the industry yet but coming up more and more and the key benefit here is that you build one single pipeline for real-time and batch consumers, as you see in the picture. The significant difference to the Lambda architecture, as you see in the middle, is that you have one processing pipeline that processes all the data in motion. That's very different from the Lambda style, where you have data in motion in one layer, and in parallel to that you have a batch layer with different technologies. The huge benefit is here you can still serve real-time but also batch applications because again not everything will be real-time in the mean in the future and kappa is not here just for real-time applications the key point is that you have a real-time infrastructure in the middle so that you can connect everything including real-time near real-time batch and request response with web services that's the huge advantage of the kappa architecture so don't misunderstand it. It's not just for real-time data, right? But the heart of the infrastructure allows you that others consume it in real-time where it's needed. Obviously, Kappa is not a free lunch. That's also super important, of course, right? So um, I'm not saying don't build a data warehouse or data lake. No. You need to be aware of the trade-offs of a Kappa architecture. Like um, if you need to reprocess data again and again, then maybe a data lake at rest is better for that, where you keep the processed and the raw data in a storage platform like a data warehouse or data lake. If you need to do complex joins, that's the typically number one um, example where you can qualify out event streaming for that. So that's where a database, a data warehouse or data lake is built for. Right? That's not screen processing if you need to do very complex joins, for example. And therefore, just keep in mind, while I'm talking today a lot about event streaming and data in motion, you should always still choose the right tool for the job. And the Kappa architecture also has some drawbacks. And with that, it's still not the right choice for everything. And often you should more think about combining the Kappa architecture with some batch layers for some workloads, like your data warehouse. The good news, however, because you really should think about the concerns of a Kappa architecture, a lot of this can be solved in different ways. And um, this is likely its own talk, right? But if you have the event streaming platform, which processes data in real time, 
then you have capabilities to solve a lot of the problems you see in the beginning of building a cup architecture, like um, a longer retention time where you can use, for example, compacted topics um, for long-term storage, or you can use tiered storage, what I will talk about later in this session today too, because it's a, a crucial part of using event streaming for a Kappa architecture so that you don't need a Lambda architecture. But there are other points like data consistency and handling late arriving data. So th there is uh, capabilities and frameworks for that. Like um, you can, can do data reprocessing and backfilling with tools like Kafka Streams or KSQL if you use Kafka native technologies or a separate layer like Apache Flink in combination with Kafka as, as the streaming cluster. And also from an integration perspective, well, while the heart of Kafka is real-time and scalable, you still need to connect to other layers. And there, are, for example, for that, there is a REST proxy so that you can also connect um, from mobile apps via HTTP to Kafka with a request response. That is not PubSub, that's not messaging, that's not asynchronous, that's a native HTTP synchronous RPC call. So just keep that in mind and think about that in more detail. Um, Kappa is not a free lunch. But for many concerns, you can solve them either directly with the event streaming platform or by um, building some of the stuff, not with the hard, with the event streaming, but with a specific tool for that, like a proxy on top of Kafka, like a data warehouse in combination with Kafka. These are not competitive technologies. They are complementary to solve your business problems. Now let's take a look at a few real world examples where Kappa already exists for several years. Uber is often the first famous example around anything, right? Um, so they build a lot of things around Kafka in early stages before others even think about that. And the same is true for the Kappa architecture. And I guess they even didn't have Kappa in mind when they have built this. But as you see in this, this picture from Uber, they have Kafka as a real-time pipeline connecting to many different systems on the left side, like their rider and driver app. On the other side, however, they also have databases connected to that. So not all of that is streaming input data. And then they can decide, depending on the use case, if they need to process the data in real time, like um, real time analytics or sending a push notification to a mobile app. For instance, when a rider requests a ride, then you need to push it to a driver after you did a lot of back end processing in real time to calculate the best driver, to calculate the estimated time of arrival, to calculate the cost of the route in an estimated way. All of that has to be processed in real time. Otherwise, this business wouldn't work. But in parallel to that, they also ingest everything into their batch layer. In this case, Uber is heavily still relying on Hadoop. For example, for ad hoc exploration, for analytics reporting. That's things where data at rest and tools like Hadoop or Spark or a data warehouse are the best technologies for. But again, as you see in this picture, one real-time scalable ingestion and processing layer. And then you can decide by yourself how to connect to that in real-time or in batch. This is much less complex than a Lambda architecture where you would have to build both of these um, processes in parallel and then often with duplicate code. Shopify is another great example. And by the way, all of these examples um, were coming from um, Kafka Summit Talks. So you can listen to their uh, full recording with much more detail and also with the detailed slides. Shopify, as you can see here, they um, also have used several building blocks to provide their Kappa architecture. No surprise that here again, Kafka is in the end the log, which um, provides the durability and also the consistency and the integration capabilities. The heart of the infrastructure is real-time and scalable so that you can provide a reliable platform also for transactional workloads, not for, just for big data. And then depending on the use case, in their case, they choose either Kafka native technologies with Kafka streams, or they had an other framework with Apache Flink that connects to the Kafka data. And once again, and, and this story repeats, as data sync, they have very different other consumers in addition to the real-time processing layers. And therefore they have different databases, SQL, NoSQL, time series databases, and so on. But the heart of the infrastructure with Kappa is a single scalable real-time layer. The third example is from Disney, which you have seen before already when I talked about the benefits and concerns of Kappa. 
And they have really given a detailed talk about um, the trade-offs and, and benefits of using Kappa in their architecture. So in the end, the key point here is really that they use Kafka to move this source of truth to a real-time infrastructure. All writes go through Kafka. Nevertheless, there are still other systems that consume the data and not all of that is real-time. So again, I repeat myself again and again, but this is the point of the Kappa architecture. Build a single infrastructure for data movement, data integration, data processing, but also for true decoupling and storage and back pressure handling. And that's what event streaming provides to you. And then you can connect any system to that. And that's the same what Disney is doing. The last example is from Twitter. Twitter is a little bit an, a different example because here they are talking much more about a migration project. So they, like so many others, started with the um, Lambda layers like Hadoop for batch and Kafka for real time. They also had their own um, stream processing framework with Heron. I think they don't spend much time on that anymore. I don't know. But the point is they moved to the cloud and now they moved to a combination of event streaming and cloud native services, heavily relying on Kafka and on Google cloud services. And with that, they have now the capability to process billions of events in real time with low latency, but high accuracy and stability. And a very simplified architecture. And with that also the benefit of having a reduced cost. So that's always the same benefits then when you go to a Kappa architecture, simplified and reduced cost. And that's huge advantages for going forward with your architecture and building new innovative applications. So in summary, and I know this is just text, right? Um, but ju just to keep in mind the benefits of the Kappa architecture, um, you really have a single infrastructure and code base to integrate and process all the data in real time at scale reliably. You can deploy that everywhere, no matter if you're in one cloud or multi-cloud or hybrid. You use a single technology for all of that in all different data centers or cloud solution provider deployments. And with that, then you can add new and new use cases, no matter if the new use case is real time, near real time, batch or request response. That doesn't matter, but the heart of the infrastructure is real time to enable you with everything. If the heart of the infrastructure is not real time, but a batch layer like a data warehouse, then you cannot connect a real time layer to that. And that's the big difference between a Kappa architecture and what um, most data warehouse vendors uh, recommend you because they recommend ingest all the data into a data warehouse first and do all the processing there. That's totally fine for the reporting use cases there and for analytics, but you cannot connect a real-time consumer to that. So then you would write the code again twice because you have to write it again in the streaming layer. If you write it in the streaming layer from the beginning, then you can still ingest it into the batch data warehouse, but another consumer can consume it from the Kappa architecture. And that's the significant difference between Lambda and Kappa. So one thing I want to talk a little bit more about, because it's crucial if you think about building your Kappa architecture with event streaming. There's two key arguments why people didn't use tools like Kafka before for building Kappa. Number one is, well, it's cost because if you store big data in a Kafka architecture, for example, um, the storage was very expensive because it was the EBS volumes in AWS or it was the SSD disks you use on-prem or HDDs. But it's, it's very expensive if you have terabytes or even petabytes of data. That's why you had a um, low retention time and ingested everything in a much cheaper data lake. So um, that's the one reason. And the other reason is with the big data sets, scalability sometimes was an issue, especially in case of, of um, errors and, and rebalancing of Kafka brokers. And therefore, storing big data long-term in Kafka was often not the right approach. However, there are so many use cases where you would do that, right? And that's one of the key points of the Kappa architecture. Reprocessing historical events with guaranteed ordering in mind and with the timestamps you get out of the box with tools like Kafka. Well, you can build many use cases much more easily, like um, adding a new consumer and reprocessing the data training analytic models from the events that are here in guaranteed ordering, um, doing error handling, reprocessing data after something failed and you need to consume the old data again and process it with new business logic. So there are many use cases, but in the, in the past, um, the, the cost and the complexity of scaling a technology like Kafka was not built for that. 
Fortunately, this changed in the meantime. And the key point for that is tiered storage in Kafka. So here's an example from Uber. As I said before, Uber is heavily relying on Hadoop and HDFS. And um, therefore, what, what they are building um, is the part of the support for Kafka um, for having an interface for tiered storage um, with Hadoop in mind. The key point here is really that you truly decouple the storage from the compute with tiered storage. And with that, you solve these two problems of having the cost, because the storage in an object store or in HDFS is much cheaper than in the Kafka broker where you have to attach an EBS volume or HDD or STD. And on the other side, also the complexity is much better for scalability because if you need to scale, if you need to be elastic, if you need to do rebalancing in Kafka, well, then you only need to do that on the brokers. And if the brokers only store a few percent of your data, then it's much easier to do. And so tiered storage solves the problems so that you now can store data long-term in Kafka even for terabytes or petabytes of data. So this is the approach from Uber. And um, here's one more. So um, Confluent has built a tiered storage for Kafka. So um, we are heavily relying on object store. In the cloud, this is things like AWS S3 or Google Cloud Storage. Or if you're on-prem in your data center, um, then it's certified for several different object store vendors. The, the story is the same like for Uber, right? You truly separate compute from storage. And this is huge because with that you can store big data sets, even terabytes or petabytes of data in the Kafka cluster and replay and reprocess it later because most of the data is offloaded to an object store, which is much, much, much cheaper than the broker disk. And also it provides the much better scalability because now the rebalancing is only needed for a percent of the data or something like that. And you can choose which topics you offload to the object store. For some topics, you want to keep them completely in the broker for whatever reason. For example, on an SDD for um, very fast processing even of, of um, persisted data. And the other huge advantage is from an application perspective. So from your Kafka consumers, it doesn't matter at all because there is no breaking changes from your applications. If you have a Kafka application today, you can connect it to an infrastructure with tiered storage no matter if you deploy it by yourself or, for example, Confluent Cloud, where you don't see that under the hood, you don't care about that because your application works the same way without any breaking changes. And also with tiered storage, you don't have any performance impacts because in Kafka, the real-time data is consumed from in-memory from the page cache anyway. So this is the number one question I get here, right? If I introduce tiered storage for a Kappa, do I have performance problems with my real-time applications? And the answer is 100% no, because real-time is coming from the memory anyway, right? So it doesn't matter for the long-term storage and reprocessing use cases. And with that now, hopefully you understand that tiered storage is a key component in an event streaming platform for building a Kappa architecture so that you don't need Lambda for every use case. Here's a great real-world example for that. So this is Honeycomb. They're an observability tool. And they have written a blog recently um, where they explained how they built what I just explained with tiered storage for reprocessing historical data. And this is really a, a cool success story for them. Number one, because the total cost of ownership was significantly reduced using tiered storage under the hood of their Kafka cluster. So they have grown 10x in two years, but the cost for Kafka only went up 20% because they offload most of the data from the expensive Kafka disks into the object store with the um, tiered storage. And the other interesting use case, and that's also what's described in their blog in detail, is that they also had some kind of, of um, um, issue and an outage where they needed to replay data from Kafka. And this only worked very well because they were running with tiered storage. So after the, the, the issue was, was fixed, they could replay the data from the tiered storage with guaranteed ordering, with all the timestamps in place, so um, that they could use tiered storage for exactly what it was meant for. Use the same Kafka consumers as before, but now not in real time, but consuming historical data without any code changes. And with this, this is really a great success story why um, um, tiered storage is a key piece of such an architecture. And now, last but not least, I want to show you a complete example. 
And by the way, we have built exactly this on GitHub. So um, for connecting hundreds of thousands of connected cars into an event streaming layer with a Kappa architecture. And there's different use cases behind that. But the number one use case we have built is for doing um, uh, the detection of potential issues in the car engine in real time with machine learning. And as you see in this picture, this is a Kappa architecture. There's a single streaming layer where you do data integration, for example, with the connected cars via MQTT, where you also do data processing and pre-processing for the data science team at scale in real time with Kafka native tools like KSQL, but where you also have the true decoupling with the um, Kafka cluster so that other consumers like the MongoDB on the right side for the digital twin in this case, can consume the data at a lower pace because that's not a real-time ingestion in this case. It's a big data near real-time ingestion. But on top, you see how we use analytics with machine learning in TensorFlow. In the middle, you see the model training. The model training is still a batch process, but it directly connects to the streaming Kafka cluster to get the data into TensorFlow and then training the analytic model in a batch workload that can take hours or even days. But still, you don't need a data lake for that because you can consume from Kafka either in real time and then keep it in TensorFlow until you have enough data. Or what happens very often when a data scientist uses the Python connectivity to Kafka, he consumes all the historical data at once from the tiered storage of Kafka. And then he starts a batch process in his Jupyter notebook. And then completely separated from the data science team that uses Python and a batch process, you deploy this analytic model in a real time streaming application in the top right completely separated from the data science team because this is now production workloads. They have 24-7 SLAs without data loss. They require very low latency even for millions of events from the cars. And for that reason, the TensorFlow model is embedded into a Kafka Streams application. And therefore, here on one picture, you see the huge advantage of a Kappa architecture. You don't need Lambda. You don't need two different infrastructures to build real-time and batch workloads. Because once again, TensorFlow model training is still batch. The MongoDB ingestion for the digital twin is still real-time. And some other web services might also connect to the data. That all doesn't matter because the heart of the infrastructure is a Kafka cluster with integration and processing capabilities, but also with the long-term storage, with tiered storage for reprocessing the data later. And here's just the two key components of that. Um, I don't spend much time on that. I have other videos on that. Um, the point really is that, as I said, for the model training, you just consume the data from your TensorFlow client in a Python app and replay the data, for example, with tiered storage, right? Super straightforward. And most machine learning tools today also have a Kafka native interface because a data lake is not necessarily needed in addition to Kafka for that, especially with tiered storage, storage in mind. And then the model deployment here is in a KSQL application now, where we embedded a TensorFlow model. Again, the key point here is there's a separation of concerns, domain-driven design. The data science teams uses Python and patch workload, patch workloads. But the production engineers, they deploy this in a real-time layer, where they embed the model. Right? Mission critical, 24-7, no, no downtime, no data loss even if it's millions of events per second that are applied for um, model inference. And with that, as the last part of, I want to talk a little bit more about the technologies. So event streaming and data in motion, that's in the end the, the concept, right? And then there is the vendors and technologies behind that. I typically like this, this very simple approach here, right? So um, the open source framework like Apache Kafka, that's more like the car engine. You can use that to build your own solution for event streaming and for building a Kappa architecture. It's battle tested, it scales well, right? But the point is many of our customers, obviously at Confluent, um, the customers want to buy a complete car. And there is different cars, of course, right? So obviously as a Confluent person, I would say that um, Confluent is more the, the Lamborghini, right? While some others are not um, because they have some, some missing features, let's say. But the point is you can buy a complete product from different vendors and you should evaluate them so that you find the right one for your use cases. And um, then you get the complete car that includes something like um, um, security, operations tooling, and all these things on top of the open source framework. 
From Confluent, our platform is 100% built on top of Kafka. We are still doing 80% of the commits to the Kafka project, open source. But then we build our complete car on top of that. We don't have 20 other frameworks to build on. We really rely on Confluent and Kafka. Some others have different approaches with 20 frameworks doing everything a little bit for some use cases. Like if you want to build a data lake only for analytics, data at rest and not so mission critical workloads, then maybe Cloudera is the right choice for you, right? Because then Kafka is only used as ingestion layer. But actually most of our customers say that real time beats slow data in most use cases, also for transactional workloads, and you connect to not just one data lake, but to many different ones. And then people come, for example, to Confluent. But what's even more interesting then is um, most of our customers today have a cloud first strategy. So this means they want to consume services and focus on their business logic, not on the infrastructure. And that's then where the self-driving car comes into play, where with Confluent Cloud, you have a fully managed solution, a self-driving car level five, so that you can just consume the service and you get all the SLAs for the infrastructure and you just consume it, including the connectivity to other systems. So this is on a high level of how I would take a look at data and motion and event streaming. Um, First of all, understand that there is um, the frameworks, the car engines. There's a few different solutions on top of these frameworks. And then there's a few cloud solutions that are really fully serverless. And then with these trade-offs in mind, you can choose the right one for you. And now, last slide, a little bit more complex. Obviously, there's even more vendors and frameworks behind that, right? Um, the event streaming landscape is pretty big in the meantime. And I'm pretty sure a Gardner Magic Quadrant or Forrester Wave is coming soon because um, this is really a paradigm shift in how you build applications. And now here you see a lot of different technologies. I will not go into detail. I have another blog post I will share in the, in the comments um, where I um, um, co compare this in much more detail. But the point is understand first, do you want to have a car engine, only the framework? Do you want to have a complete car that you manage by yourself? Or do you want to have a fully managed service? And then if it's a fully managed service, should it still be um, um, compliant to the open technologies so that you can use other tools like with Confluent Cloud built on Kafka? Or maybe it's only okay if it's the Kafka protocol. Like in, in Microsoft Azure, you get event hubs, which actually uses the Kafka protocol. And that's another proof that Kafka became the de facto standard for event streaming. But obviously, it's also not fully compliant because it um, is very limited in supporting all the features of the Kafka protocol. So you cannot connect every existing Kafka application easily to it. And then in some other use cases, maybe if you're just on AWS and you just want to do some processing, then maybe Kinesis is the right tool. If the pricing works for you and if the APIs work for you. So the key questions you should ask yourself, do you need a cloud native technology? Cloud native doesn't mean cloud only, but it means elastic and scalable. So from Confluent perspective, it means things like tiered storage to truly decouple storage and compute. But also, for example, we provide a self-balancing clusters so that you can really handle the rebalancing automatically. You don't do that by yourself, no matter if you're in the cloud or in your data center. The second question you have to ask yourself is, is it complete? Many people only think about Kafka and maybe even just as an ingestion layer into a data lake. But Kafka is so much more with the stream processing, with the data integration, with the storage, with the security. And then do you want to have the complete car and how complete should it be instead of just using an engine? For example, do you want to build your own Kafka Connect connectors? Or do you want to get a vendor which has a list of 100 or more connectors, including very advanced ones like Oracle Change Data Capture or um, Salesforce Change Data Capture integration, right? That, that's what you need to evaluate for the complete solution. Build versus buy is always the question. And the last part about this is, um, do you need or want to run this um, event streaming technology everywhere? So maybe you're just in one cloud, but maybe you're multi-cloud. Or in many cases, our customers are hybrid. They deploy on-prem or even at the edge outside a data center, like in a factory or even embedded Kafka broker in a vehicle. And on the other side, they have the big elastic cloud cluster in one or more clouds. And that things where um, you need a vendor then which supports on-prem self-managed solutions, but also the serverless cloud offering on multi-clouds. And even more important than that then, also the linking between these different deployments of Kafka. 
And that's then where at Confluent we have, for example, um, cluster linking so that you don't need additional tools like Mirror Maker for connecting different clusters. But obviously that's a Confluent point of view. I really ask you that you evaluate this by yourself and find the right insights and feel free to reach out to me and let me know um, if you don't agree with anything of that or if you have a different perspective. So that's totally fine. So it's critical to choose the right tool. And with that, I'm at the end of my discussion about the Kappa versus the Lambda architecture. I think you really should at least evaluate when you start a new project. Do I need that other data lake just for storing data at batch and for doing the processing? Or as another question, where should I do my processing if I have Kafka and if I have a data warehouse like Snowflake? Should I do the processing in the Kafka layer or should I do it in the Snowflake data warehouse? Uh, it always has trade-offs, right? But keep in mind, if you process the data in the data warehouse, then you can only use the process data there at rest. You cannot connect a real-time consumer to the data lake. I mean, you can do, but it's not really a good architecture. It's, it's more an anti-pattern. It's often more costly. And it's also not working for low latency use cases. And also from a criticality perspective, most of our customers for, um, for analytics data lakes, they have very different SLAs from an operations perspective and from a data loss perspective compared to the event streaming layer where you also build your instant payment platform, where you build your fraud detection layer. That's use cases that only make sense in real time without data loss. And that's why people build it on top of Kafka and not on top of Snowflake or something like that. But with that again, my last note, these technologies are complementary. Event streaming does some things very well. A data warehouse does some things very well. Uh, data Lake is still great for machine learning and model training and reporting, right? So understand these options and then evaluate how to combine them. But in many cases today, by building a Kappa architecture instead of using a Lambda architecture, because the pros are much bigger than the cons when you compare the trade-offs. And with that, thanks for listening. I hope you learned a lot. Feel free to reach out to me and connect on Twitter or LinkedIn. And um, see you soon in another video or reading my blog.